Welcome to Endless Space Disharmony and Gaming with Greg. Today we're going to be playing oh, the first 20 turns or so. And I'm just going to walk you through some of the basics. Here we go. Space is deep, dark, and dangerous. But then, so are we. We have risen and fallen, learned to adapt and rebuild. For our history is a history of struggle and survival. We protect our own. We take what we need and salvage what we find. To be a vaulter is to work hard, fight hard, and celebrate hard. Because life is hard. But it is also beautiful. And even in the deep dark of space, it never fails to give us hope. All right. <clears throat> Welcome to Endless Space Disharmony. We are the Vaulters. We are the Space Viking Savants of the Galaxy. And we will prevail. So. Rather than go into a lot of detail right up front, uh, I'm just going to start playing the game and sort of explaining uh, what it is I'm doing as I'm playing. Um, trying to point out as much detail as I can to help those who might be new to the game and just give people uh, an idea of how I play the game. And maybe you'll learn something or maybe you'll be able to teach me something. So let's start with who we are. We are the Vaulters. Uh, this is the diplomacy screen. On this screen we can learn about other factions we meet uh, and even do some trade and diplomacy with them at that point in time. But this is who we are and this is what makes the Vaulters awesome. The first thing that you need to know about the Vaulters is the Vaulter Affinity. So the Vaulter Affinity is basically our unique trait. No other race has this unique trait or ability. Um, our unique trait is our science and we have a, a unique technology that allows us to teleport. Uh, we can teleport from system to system and we can teleport entire fleets all the way across the galaxy any distance uh, in the blink of an eye. So it's a, it's a very powerful logistic tool for defense primarily uh, and allows us to have a single large defensive fleet protect a very large expanse of space uh, effectively. One of the downsides to the portal is if you do lose systems where you've built these portals the enemy gets access to using them. Um, so it can actually open up doors for other players uh, if you're not careful. We are fearless warriors. Uh, this gives us a big bonus on our defensive planets so it, it takes a lot more effort for somebody to take a system away from us than uh, a normal system with normal uh, people. We're all warriors. Every every vaulter is a warrior and a scientist. Uh, rebellion. Uh, so what this does is rebellion allows us to take over systems more quickly. So each time we take over a system there's a certain amount of time it takes before it actually becomes our system and each time we do that um, we reduce the amount of time it takes. Um, so taking over lots of systems quickly can lead to um, competence essentially. However the opposite is also true. So each time we lose a system we lose um, the ability to take it over more quickly and it can actually steamroll the opposite direction if we're not careful. Isolation shields is basically just a level one science tech. Gives us access to the little tier one science building. Crowded planets. Um, we are formerly subterranean uh, peoples, so in our history, uh, we crashed a big spaceship into a planet and lived underground inside the spaceship for a, a lengthy period of time. Uh, we finally made our way out, and now we're back in the stars where we belong. But as a result, we learned how to live in very tight quarters. So that allows us to keep more crowded planets than other. Uh, other races might be able to. We have legendary heroes, so our heroes start with a fair amount of experience and a couple levels under their belt, which is pretty powerful. 
uh, we're kitchen chemists so basically every vaulter is a is a scientist and this gives us additional science per population um, we actually have the scientist trait as well which gives us a percent bonus to science and because um, we're a bit rough around the edges and we've lived underground for quite a long time we're not real good with plants and so we're good with technology you know we're good in caves but plants not so much so we have a penalty to food production so this is our one drawback we're not really good at producing lots of food and food is directly related to how fast your uh, systems grow uh, there are some ways to kind of get around this though so that's who we are the next thing we're going to do is just kind of take a look at where we're at in the galaxy at large here so this is our galaxy that we find ourselves in you can see I picked a four spiral so you can kind of make out the four spiral arms of this galaxy and the large center cluster of stars and we're out on this arm and you'll notice our star in the middle Rotenev, Rotenev? I don't really like that name we'll we'll fix that shortly uh, our star in the middle has four planets um, one of which we've colonized three of which we are unable to colonize but maybe we'll be able to soon with science uh, we also have access to a white sun star through a wormhole wormholes require special technology to use but these other uh, straight lines are called cosmic strings and our ships can travel along these cosmic strings from one spot to the next um, they are one-way trips so once you start in a direction you cannot turn around until you get all the way to where you're going um, if you mouse over these it'll give you a little bit of information about the type of star and what kinds of planets might be in those systems there's always a chance for any kind of planet to be in any system um, but they are better odds in different ones so let's take a look closer look at our system this is where the beauty of this game really starts to shine um, you can see gonna see our star our, we have a dual star over there here's our main Terran planet it's just an earth-like planet we also have a hydrogen planet uh, kind of looks like Jupiter we have an asteroid belt and then we have a large barren planet so something similar to the moon eventually we'll be able to colonize all of these and you can see the potential population for each of these currently listed on there but it also says we don't know how to colonize these we don't know how to live on those environments yet and then you'll notice this large blinky exploitation thing so let's see what that's all about and this is where they're another beautiful candy shot of our planet with the star in the background and uh, this is just uh, some information now there's a lot of information in this game that's sort of hidden from view and what you'll find is if you mouse over things you get a lot of information so for instance Terran what does a Terran mean well mouse over it it'll tell you exactly what the output for any Terran planet in your system will be well what does medium mean well mouse over it medium will tell you of all the different planet types this is how many people or how many population those types of planets will get if they're a medium planet so um, anomalies well we don't have any anomalies currently but there is a resource on this planet and so if we figure out how to mine this resource we can get plus 10 approval plus 2 dust plus 1 science per population and uh, potentially up to 60% extra movement on our empire by using these ionic crystals as a fuel source. So that's pretty neat. Notice exploitation. No exploitation has been chosen. So what is exploitation? Well, exploitation is basically what are your people doing? So you have all these people on the planet. What are they focusing on? And you can only have one focus per planet at a time so uh, we could focus on food and what this will do is produce a little bit of extra food on our planet per population uh, we could focus on industry 
We could focus on dust, or we could focus on science. Now we're already pretty good at science, um, but we are really, really bad at food. And so food uh, is probably what we want to try to boost up initially at least. So I'm going to choose food. And this is pretty cool. So what this will do is if you have a jungle planet, it'll give you plus one food. Uh, an ocean planet, plus one food. Any planet, plus one food. And a Terran planet is plus one food. Now you notice that our planet is a planet and it is also Terran. So that means that we will get plus two food um, for choosing this particular uh, exploitation. Um, the other exploitations will give you benefits to other planet types. So for instance, the industrial one gives you more benefit on tundra and lava planets initially, but it'll give you a little bit of a benefit on any planet. And uh, dust will give you benefits on arid and desert planets, but a little bit of dust on any planet. And then the science buff is for arctic and barren planets, but it'll also boost science on any planet type. It just does it a little bit more on those uh, specific types. And these exploitations are uh, upgradable. So these are tier one exploitations. We can actually um, get better ones that'll give you more resources um, or cover a wider spread of planet types. Um, the other thing that's neat about exploitations is they're not permanent and so you can constantly switch between them as your needs change. So early on you want to grow your population, you choose um, food. Later on, say you're, you're having trouble with money and with paying upkeep costs, switch a couple of your planets to dust and take care of those problems temporarily. Need to build a, a massive fleet of ships, switch to industry. It's pretty cheap to switch once you get into the mid game, so never feel like uh, you're stuck with a single exploitation for any length of time. All right, so now that we've chosen that, you'll notice that down here it's queued it up for us. So this is the first thing in the queue. This is what it is. Here's the name. Here's how many turns it's going to take. And if we had enough dust, we could just buy it, and that would instantly um, finish the production of this within the next turn. So it's only 93 dust. That sounds like a lot right now, but later in the game, 93 dust is is pretty easy to come by. The other thing we can do is we can go ahead and queue up our science building. This is our science tech that we started with. It gives us access to this building. Just gives us a little bit of science per person. So this will be uh, three science per turn and more as we grow um, in size. We can also look at these other planets. Um, notice that this one, it'll tell you exactly what technology you need in order to colonize this planet if you're missing something. And notice that this planet does not produce any food, but it has a lot of dust per person. So different planet types are good for different resources. Um, asteroids are really difficult to colonize. They also can be very beneficial. You can see they have pretty high outputs on most of these. Barren planets are strong science planets. Not much else on a barren planet, but there's definitely some science to be had there for whatever reason. Um, I don't like the name of our home system, so I'm going to change it. We'll call it Valteria. And you can change the name of every system you have. Um, unfortunately, individual planets are just going to be named as sequence after the star system. All right, so that's that. Let's take a look at what else we can do on this first turn. So over here, um, here's a, just some, some information on the story. Uh, these things pop up periodically and then sometimes random events will happen. 
These are heroes that are in the academy available for recruitment. Um, this is actually a really good hero. This one's not so great. And this one's okay. So, depending on what you want to do with a hero, um, all heroes have their uses. The ones that I'm most interested in um, are going to be the ones that help govern our systems and increase the outputs of our stuff in our systems. So we can come to this screen and we can look at them once again more closely if we want to. This is the guy I was looking at and notice he's a, an administrator and he also has the corporate trait. So each hero gets two traits. Um, they give you particular trees that you can uh, put um, experience points into and give you different stuff. Um, these particular traits are really good for cities and for systems for growing your empire. Um, the commander trait and the pilot trait are better for a combat oriented hero um, commander of a fleet. So uh, she might make a good fleet commander with with her commander trait. Um, this one would be a good flex leader. So uh, could be mostly a governor, but also jump in and, and um, command a fleet as necessary. He will not be as good commanding a fleet, but he'll be fantastic um, in a system. So we'll get him a little bit later. Um, we've already queued up some buildings. Um, we have some ships to deal with, but before we do that, I'm going to come to this screen and uh, show you our taxes. So the way taxes in this game work, you have a tax rate. And for most factions, the tax rate is a function of approval and or dust. So as you increase the tax rate, your approval goes down. As you decrease the tax rate, your approval goes up and your dust output goes down. So we can make systems happy or even ecstatic if we can get our approval high enough. And there are some benefits for these breakpoints. So there's a breakpoint here. You'll notice that our system resources change slightly when we hit that breakpoint. Um, happy people are more productive. However, notice the tax rate lowers the amount of dust we get. We can also tax our people to get lots of dust. And notice the output of a taxed system is almost nothing. So there are situations where this could be beneficial um, or even absolutely necessary, depending on what's going on. Um, The important thing to know is you don't want to tax your people too much unless you have a reason to. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to tax, tax the hell out of them this very first turn. And the reason I'm going to do that is because of this. I have 10 dust and I want 10 dust. Now I, I have two ways I could go about doing this. I could wait. Um, several turns until I get the dust at a lower tax rate or I can just go ahead and grab it right now and then lower the tax rate afterwards and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a one turn hit to get the the hero hired as quickly as possible get him on a system and get him up and running and then I'm gonna lower my tax rate to almost nothing um, because I don't really need to rush the second hero uh, but I I really want that first hero um, and I'll show you why. Uh, the Vaulters have a, a special way that they deal with heroes. So we're going to go there. Um, we're going to go to the next screen. This is our science tree. This tree is very complex, but it, it becomes more intuitive as you play the game and you learn where things are at. Um, it's color-coded 
at this zoom. So out here it's really hard to see what the hell anything is. You zoom in and boom, you can see some color coded, uh, the co color codes don't mean much to you right now, but they will in time and it makes it real easy to see, find what it is you need. Um, you'll also notice that it's broken into four branches and each branch has a focus and so it's pretty easy to um, find what you're looking for. Um, what I'm looking for is this right here, Inway Fusion. And why am I looking for this? Well, this is industry. So any building that has this little orange marking in the corner is going to increase industry output in some way. Um, industry is really important to getting other buildings up and running and really important in getting a navy, a naval force established and you're going to need a naval force relatively quickly in the game. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to grab this and notice right now it's saying seven turns that is not going to be the case. It's only saying that because my tax rate's so high and my people are really unhappy and they're like to hell with you man we're not we're not going to do what you say. We're not working on that. You're taking all of our money but it's for a good reason. They just need to trust me. It'll all be okay. Um, one thing about this screen that's helpful is if you do know what you're interested in or what you need, um, holding down shift allows you to queue up multiple ones in a row. So I can queue that one up and then I can come and grab this one for instance and then that one and then that one and then that one if I wanted to. Um, right now I'm just going to take this one. Um, I'm not sure what I'm going to need right away yet, but um, once I get a better idea of um, where we're at and what we might need, I'll, uh, I'll queue up a string of them. It's 20 minutes in and we haven't even uh, taken the first turn yet. Pretty typical. Pretty typical of my play style. Okay, we've got some ships. Ships are divided into individual fleets. Fleets can move as a group if they're both highlighted or if I only want to move one I can highlight them independently. I do not want to move them together. Um, I'm going to send our probe. We know just kind of roughly the position. We're close to the main body. Um, that's what this wormhole will send us to is that central body of star systems that all of the arms are attached to. We know that the vast majority of stars in our arm are going to be down this way. So I'm going to send this guy right over there. There we go. Okay, so he's discovered a new star. Notice three planets all red, which means we can't colonize any of them immediately. We can take a look. Oh, this is a promising system. Okay. So the first thing that I notice when I'm looking at this is I see arid tundra desert. Arid and tundra are difficult to colonize at the beginning of the game, but they become significantly easier early in the game. There are some of the earlier texts that you learn. Um, this is a, a cool little anomaly. Uh, it gives you a bonus to what your normal outputs on this planet would be. And this is a penalty, so we don't like to see the red ones. Um, that makes it a little harder to get any output on this system. There are ways to get rid of that, though. And then a uh, huge desert, you can see a desert doesn't have great output, but it does create a lot of dust. And it does have a fair amount of population, so. So this is an interesting system. It's not fantastic, but it's something we could uh, grab pretty early if we wanted to. One thing that I can do with this probe is uh, I have these commands. And one of the commands is automatically explore. So if there's any unexplored territory, he'll kind of head towards it. So I'm going to just turn that on and then direct him that way, and then he'll just kind of finish exploring. Um, I'm kind of surprised that these two systems don't have a string, but since they don't, I'm going to go ahead and send my other ship, which just happens to be a clan ship or a colony ship. These ships can colonize any star uh, that has a white planet. So if we get to a system and we see a little white circle, that means we can go ahead and use this guy. 
Also, we got this cosmic event. So these events pop up each time you grab one of these little star flags. The first player that gets to these, get these. Um, they're usually very beneficial. Um, this one was just five extra dust. So that's actually really beneficial. Um, I'm going to show you why. I'm glad I didn't end my turn yet. So now that we have 15 dust, <coughs> we can come back here and we can say, you know, guys, maybe you were right. Maybe we don't need to tax you so much. Now we're still going to get our hero on turn two. And we don't even have to make people unhappy. Um, if you look up here in the corner, you'll see uh, a little gray smiley face. Watch what happens when I move this slider. Turns green. Turns orange. Turns red. So that's um, another clue um, for you, just a visual clue. All right. I think we're just about ready to end our turn. Um, we have structures being built. We have science chosen. We have ships scouting or on their way to scout. We have our tax rate set for the turn. Let's go ahead and end our turn. All right, turn two. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get a, all of our ships moving. Oh boy. That was kind of a loud event. What do we got here? An unknown fleet. I don't think... I don't think this ship has quite made it to us yet. So we have a discovery effects. Plus 25% XP bonus for each battle on hero. So this is interesting. Um, we're going to get a, a large bonus to experience. in this system for our hero. This is um, this is promising. Arica has been discovered. Well, we didn't discover it, but... Alright, so here's another system. So notice we have a large ocean world. Fantastic for what we need. Um, metallic waters increases industry output and approval. We also have a medium barren with a positive anomaly. And then two lava planets, which we're not going to be able to utilize in the early game. <clears throat> but they are actually really powerful in the mid game um, because of all the industry output. And so they can become fantastic forge worlds for ship development. So since we have our uh, ship here, we're going to go ahead and we're going to colonize the system. We have now turned it into an outpost. And in 30 turns, we will reduce it from an outpost, a lowly outpost, to a brilliant colony. And once it becomes a colony, we create this border effect. And this means that other civilizations will not be able to just move through our territory can't move through our turf without permission or you know war as long as it's in this state they're they're free to move in and out as they please and that's a little unsettling but we'll deal with that as it happens so oh here we go the very first thing that I always build whenever I colonize a system is my vaulter apertures so this will take three turns, but this is our teleporter, and it allows us to get our traffic from any part of the system to here instantly. It also eliminates expansion disapproval, which is crazy. 
I'm must have 100% control of system to build portal. Interesting. Alright, well we won't be doing that right away then. I'm curious, what are we at? It says we have 100% control. Oh, we'll go ahead and do that for now. Okay, so the whole point of the tax thing earlier was to get our heroes. Let's do that before we forget. We would like you. We're going to hire you. And we are going to put you right here. Now, because we put him in this system and because we got that special event, we just got really lucky because he's going to level up extremely quickly. And... So here we go. Um, over here on the right, this will tell you what he provides the system. Over here on the left, this will tell you his level, um, what traits he has, his upkeep, and where he's located. These are his attribute points. And these attribute points are directly related to these numbers over here. So the first thing is I'll show you the, the tree. So it looks rather complicated at first. What you need to know is the gray part of the tree is the universal hero tree. Every hero has these um, branches. The green branches are specific to the administrator class. And so if there are certain things that I want to grab out of the administer class, administrator class, I need to follow the proper branch. So director one gives me plus three labor and it unlocks these two. Um, director two will unlock this. Um, crop genetics will unlock that. And so on and so forth. Um, if I click on his second trait, corporate, you'll see the same gray tree but you'll see different branches and so this guy has some pretty nifty buffs to both science dust industry and food um, the corporate is the science and dust tree the administrator is the food and industry tree we're gonna definitely go food and industry and the very first thing we want to do in this system is we want it to grow we want more people there it started with just one population so I'm going to go ahead and take this plus 15 food. That's going to basically offset the penalty that we have as a faction for um, Black Thumb. We'll go ahead and accept that. And up here at the top, you can see that our uh, our birth rate, growth rate is pretty high. We're gonna we're gonna start popping these populations out here pretty quickly. This will this will give you an idea of how long it'll take you to grow with your current food level. Um, dust is kind of bad at the moment, but we'll fix that shortly. Okay, um, this is just telling us we got a hero, and we've already assigned us points for this turn. And before we do anything else. Um, I just want to take a moment. If you look really carefully, you could actually see um, little spaceships flying around on the surface of the planet. Uh, it's just such a beautiful game. And I, I really appreciate all the uh, hard work they put into making it look this good. All right, that didn't take nearly as long as the first turn. OK, 
Okay. We've discovered somebody. We are not alone. The pilgrims. Interesting. Okay, well, we'll take a look at that here shortly. There's their home world. Now we know. Kind of boxed in here. I don't really like that, but uh, this is a smaller map, so we might just be on a small arm. Um, so I have a slight problem with this, but I think I'm going to do it anyways. All right, so a couple things I want you to notice here. Um, the first thing, from this view, um, you can see each system, and you can see the the uh, luxury or strategic resources that the system has. But you can also see by its symbol what they're building. And if you uh, if you look really carefully, you can see the progress meter. And so when this little blue line fills all the way up, um, it'll be complete. You also see in our home system this is our portal and so every system that has this little icon it has a portal link which means we can teleport as soon as we complete this construction we will have a portal here and we'll be able to teleport between these two systems well, that was just a message saying that he's discovered everything that he technically could um, the border that this guy is putting down this little area is going to make things a little complicated because we're not able to move through that. Um, now that we know it's there, we're not able to go into his space any longer freely. Okay, got plenty of things queued up there. We've still got plenty of things queued up here. Um, making dust at this point in the game is not that important. One thing that is important is getting your systems grown. And so notice the food output here is so much higher because of the 15 we got from the hero ability. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop our tax rate down to where we're just I don't know if we can Can go here. So by dropping it here, we're down to three dust per turn, which is terrible, but it's at least it's not negative. Um, but this becomes ecstatic, and you can see the the outputs. They don't go up a lot, but they they go up, and because they go up, um, this is going to help snowball things a little bit quicker. So right now we're looking at four star systems that are easily accessible. Um, one of them doesn't look super fantastic in Ying, but it did have um, it did have a few relatively easily colonizable systems. Um, we'll have to choose which one we want next turn. The other system we haven't identified yet, and our scout ship is really far away and probably will not be back. Well, quite some time. I'm hoping that there's more systems back here, but I'm beginning to wonder if we're just in a small region at the moment. Inway fusion plants previously thought practically impossible. Recent advances in shielding technology permit more than two bodies to be involved in a fusion reaction. Alright, so we, we've finished this tech that's unlocked both of these for us. We need to pick a new one. I'm thinking that the most important thing that we can do is colonize Ying um, 
if at all possible, before he gets to, and force him into a corner. We got lucky with um, Xanados. If we can grab Ying, that'll really put him in a bind. Now, taking a look at our options, we can learn Arid or Tundra planets pretty quickly. Um, notice that the Arid planet has two very beneficial resources, um, Ancient Artifacts and Titanium. This is a no-brainer. We want to colonize this planet as quickly as possible. So two things are going to have to happen in order for that to happen. The first thing that's going to have to happen is we need to research Arid Epigenetics. This little green star icon is related to exploration and colonization. So you can scroll down this tree and you can see um, all of these are going to either give us exploration points like this, more movement on our ships, um, or the ability to colonize different types of systems. So we're going to grab that. It'll only take two turns. And we really need this clan ship. But so I'm going to finish off the evolved soils in two turns. Um, get the um, industry plant up and running which is going to give us a nice little buff to our in, uh, industry output on this system. And then, actually, I may take the clan ship off. Uh, we may end up doing this over here. Getting a clan ship up over here is actually going to be faster. Notice we're already at three, just because of how fast we're growing. Um, let's see what we can do with this. The, this may go a little bit quicker. So let's talk about titanium real quick and why titanium is important. So the purple resources that you find in the universe are all positive anomalies. They're um, they're going to give you some minor of output benefit in your system. The other thing that they're going to do is they're going to give you access to specific um, systems on your ships. So without these resources in your empire, you cannot build certain types of weapons or defensive units. And so it becomes increasingly important to control the systems and the planets that hold these resources. And if you do, and you could get essentially a monopoly on them, or a lot of them, in your empire, the cost of those resources and the cost of building those um, types of structures on ships goes down significantly. So it's, um, it's a very beneficial thing to grab as many of these as you can. Now where do they come from? Well, if you go to the research tree, um, science and technology, so this is going to be science buildings, industry buildings, and certain types of resources. And so all the strategic resources are purple, and they'll be mainly on this side of the tree. You'll see there's one down here, and then there's some tier 2, tier 3 resources um, over here. So. Those are required for certain structures to be built or certain modules. Titanium, pretty good. I'll go ahead and end my turn. Our ship's getting closer. 
All right, now we have our gate. So now you can see both of these uh, star systems have the little white cube, disintegrating cube, whatever you want to call it. That is our portal. That means we can teleport between these two. One thing we want to constantly do is check our dust output and our happiness. Um, we're not going to be able to keep this level of dust for very long. As we build new structures, new buildings, um, we're going to need more dust. And so this is eventually going to go negative on us. But until it does, let's just keep it where it's at. We have our science for one more turn. He's still traveling. There's not really much else we can do, so turns are going to start going a lot more quickly. Alright. Now you'll notice um, we finished this science. We need new research. But by finishing that, this planet has turned white, which means we can colonize it now. So that's fantastic. We've already gained another population here. We're two turns away from that. Nine turns, yeah. Let's go ahead and let's finish this out. Alright, new research. So, we're already starting to get really tight on dust. The good news is, there are a lot of ways to deal with that. And one way to deal with that are things over here in the diplomacy and trading tree. So in this tree, you're going to find lots of technologies that have a little goldish yellow icon in the corner. These are our dust related technologies. So these technologies will all increase dust output. The very first technology um, increases dust output for Terran, jungle, ocean, arid, and tundra planets. It's basically tourism. So people want to travel and see different worlds and we make a little dust because of that. That's the idea. We also unlock these um, anomalies so if we have any planets that have these, we'll start to gain the benefit of them. So we'll go ahead and queue that one up. That will fix our dust problems. And we made it. Oh boy. Well... It's not a great system. It does have titanium. It's something that I would prefer that our neighbor not have, which is unfortunate. So here's the problem that I, I have with my ship being over here. Unfortunately, until you get much higher levels of technology, you cannot travel <coughs> in open space. Ships can only travel along cosmic strings, which are what these lines represent. Um, I cannot move a ship into another faction's territory without negotiating um, passage. And there are only a couple of ways that you can negotiate passage. So. Um, the first way is to straight up declare war. Uh, just, you know, violate their borders, declare war. Uh, that can be dangerous because, you know, when you're at war, they tend to fight you. The second way is if you make friends with them and you have a peace agreement, you can declare open borders. Um, 
And when you have open borders, then you're able to pass through each other's territory without causing each other ire. I have a, an issue in that I really want to scout this protostar, but I don't have a ship to do it, and I won't have a ship to do it for quite some time. I don't think there's any way that this ship is going to be of any use to me if I just sit here. He's not going to prevent them from taking this system. He'll he'll shoot it down pretty easily. So I think, unfortunately, what I'm going to have to do is we're going to have to talk to these guys and say, look, buddy, your borders, they don't mean nothing to us. And that's what we'll do. So now that we're at war, I can actually uh, cue this movement. It won't let me select this as a legal move um, during a Cold War. We're not allowed to violate borders when we're in Cold War. But now we can. And I really want this ship particularly to head over there. So that's where he's going to go. We did get 10 dust for searching that planet. So... It wasn't a total loss. Um, because we're at war, we definitely are going to need to get some military ships up here quickly. Alright, he's sending what looks like his scout. Alright, notice our dust has actually gone up, and that's because we're growing our populations. And so as those populations grow, um, we make more of everything. And that's, it, it's a constantly a, a balancing trick. So you really want to check this screen every turn and adjust your levels accordingly. This is still the best spot because it puts him at ecstatic and him at happy. And that's going to just continue to help us. In and out. New research. Okay, so we know that we're going to be settling an arid planet soon. Arid planets are notoriously bad at having food. However, Soil xenobiology is a great way to get extra food on arid, tundra, arctic, and desert planets. Now keep in mind, this building has absolutely no effect on um, any other planet type. So it's a terrible building to build everywhere. You would never want to just build this indiscriminately. Um, and in fact, I think in many systems you can't even build this structure. It won't even show up in the queue. Um, unless you have at least one of those planet types. But um, it's a great idea to get it if you have several of those types of planets, and it'll help you get uh, population on the rest of your system faster. This also gives us alien grafting, and alien grafting is actually the better of the two. Um, this one is the one that is uh, our tier 2 exploitation. So what this does is it makes our normal tier 1 exploitation better. So that's what we're going to grab next. And both of these planets have the tier 1 exploitation. They will automatically upgrade to the tier 2 exploitation and produce even more food than they're producing now um, as soon as uh, we get that finished. I'm also going to go ahead and queue up the dust, and I'm actually going to move it in front of the science right now. We are moving through the science tree at a good clip at the moment, so once it starts to get a little bit slower and we're taking more turns to get through the science techs, um, also once we get more population, this building is much better mid-game, you know, when you have planets and planets and planets full of population. It's a, it's a very strong building in that circumstance. Not so strong when you're down at one, two, or three. Okay, we've 
Gotten that figured out. This is telling us that we now have access to all of these lovely guys. And so one thing that happened is this was unlocked for us. So this is increasing the output on this planet now. Um, also, I guess not this one. This is a higher tier. So we'll get this one later. And maybe this one is. Yeah, this one's later as well. I thought maybe it was one that we had already. Alright. see right there he uses this teleport so that took no movement all right so our hero finally leveled up and we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna give him the plus 10 industry on star system so this is gonna help us get our uh, colony ship out and, and future ships out much quicker and we're going to use him on this star system to pump out a naval force here shortly. Every good navy needs to have some weapons to put on their ships. So let's go ahead and get the two basic weapons that we don't currently have. Everybody starts with basic kinetic weapons, tier 1 kinetics, um, just bullets, but now we'll have lasers and torpedoes to add to our ships here shortly. Okay, so we found another large system. No easy planets in this system. In fact, they're all pretty bad. The, the desert would be the easiest one to colonize. And it is a large desert, which is good. But it has shattered crust, which is a mixed penalty. That's actually not bad for a desert planet. Desert planets start with a lot of dust anyways. So having higher industry makes it more useful than just a regular desert without this. The glittering halls is an interesting... Um, this is actually one of the endless wonders, and I'll talk about those more later. It's not something we'll be able to touch anytime during this video. You'll do, you will notice that the wonders have a little yellow ring, yeah, so if you're ever wondering where they're at, that's one easy way to find them. And we got five science. We're going to keep searching. If I can... Yeah, it's going to be hard for me to keep him out of there. Well, we'll do what we can. Four turns away. Check our tax rate. Still at plus five. Still looking good. All right, we have some basic military weapons that we can equip our ships with, but we don't even have a military ship, really. Um, you start the game with a, a basic ship type. Um, this is the first true military ship, so I think what we're going to do, we don't really need the Tundra tech right away, but it is a necessary tech to grab this, and we're going to queue both of those up, and so in about four turns we'll be able to start pumping out 
real military ships, which we're going to need very, very soon. Gemini. What do we get for searching Gemini? Ten more science. Good. So Gemini is an interesting system. It has a lot of positive... Um, A lot of positive anomalies, plus 20. So this would actually be a good system to settle. Um, Arctic planets have a penalty to approval, but this planet negates that penalty for both of these. So I could actually settle both of these with almost no penalty. So that's actually probably a, a really good place to try to grab eventually. Um, what I want to do with this ship now is he's not much use to me, but he is good at potentially blockading these two. So I'm going to set him on Xanados, and I'm going to, because we don't have borders on Xanados yet, we haven't been there long enough to create uh, true borders for that system. Uh, it's still considered an outpost in this stage outposts you can move through um, colonies and with borders cannot be moved through without war although we're at war anyways so I guess it doesn't matter actually what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send him over to Ying close to filling this planet up. We do not have another planet in this system we can really mess with yet. But what we can do is maybe throw another clan ship on there and uh, get that out. Almost to turn 20. Oh, here it comes. So this is so by mousing over uh, well then when he stops moving by mousing over this fleet I get a little bit of information on what he has so first thing that you'll notice is a little satellite dish these are the command points basic ships cost one command point um, tier two ships cost two tier three cost three and, and so on and so forth or maybe it is one two four uh, either way, the bigger the ship, the more command points it costs. Right now he has one point out of five, which means he has one ship in this. Um, he has a total offensive melee power, or uh, his offensive power is 21 points. His invasion power is zero, that's important. And he has full health and no hero and no movement points left. So this gives you just a basic uh, rundown of information. If we want to look at how he compares to my ship, it's pretty much identical. You'll see I have 105, uh, 20 instead of 21, uh, 0 invasion, and 0 of 7. So he might have some text that give him a little more speed, or he might have upgraded his ship. I don't know. There's still not much we can do. This guy's almost done. This guy's building what he can, so. And there we go. All right, so this icon represents ships that are in the hangar. So you can see right here, we have one ship in the hangar. That's what that symbol means, a ship with a one. If we go here to the hangar, we can see that our clan ship is there. And we can turn it into a fleet by hitting create. There it is. We're going to send him over to Ying as quickly as possible. And then this ship, I'm going to go ahead and set to 
intercept. So what this does is this has a couple of things. Number one is it puts a blockade around the system and as long as my ship is here he cannot colonize this system. He's gonna have to move my ship off with a, a military ship of his own. He's just scouting this part of the system so he's gonna know about these planets pretty soon. My guess is he'll probably try to colonize Rainus first. we'll have our second hero and we now have military ships so I'll take just a brief moment to um, we'll have a few turns before we Um, get our military ships out. We'll need to build some invasion ships, um, some siege ships, as well as just straight up military ships. I think I'm going to grab this tech and then this one. So this will give us the ability to siege a planet, and this will give us the ability to colonize that Arctic planet over in Gemini if we want. And we can get one. him moving, we'll have him on there next turn, and we'll also be able to hire a hero next turn to get him up and running faster. Alright, notice that our ships stacked, so in order to see them, we mouse over and we can choose them individually, or you can hold control and you can group them. Um, that's important if you want to move a large number of fleets together. We don't. I want to take this clan ship, and this is how we colonize a planet. If we didn't see it earlier, you click on the colony ship, you look for this icon flashing, and that means that there's potential to land these people somewhere and we want to put them right here and then we want to get this guy up and running so the very first thing I always do is that followed by that followed by food dust science just get it all get it taken care of and now we have 81 dust each hero costs progressively more to hire. Um, we're going to go ahead and hire this hero. This hero is good early game for getting your system up and running, similarly to the last guy, but can also be switched over to a commander. So we're going to start with her, or him, or it. And I'm going to start with the basic labor and I'm actually going to go with the industry well food is going to be the biggest issue on an arid planet um, Let's go with labor and food. And then let's assign it to Yank. Alright. Alright. Well, we've got a lot of ships moving our way now, so he's already got a military started. He's moving 
I think that's actually the scout coming back this way. But he's got a couple of military ships. We can tell. Um, actually, this is a colony ship. You can tell it's a colony ship because it has no offensive power. So he is looking to colonize one of these two systems. I don't think that my probe can intercept him. But we can try. We sure can try. Alright, Xanado is just about ready to finish up that. And it is time to build some ships. So each ship has some interesting traits. Um, this basic ship is more of a science ship. It can be, it's kind of a, it can be used for a lot of different things. Um, one of the primary things that it's used for is it gets a discount on all support modules. So all of these things cost a lot less on this ship than they would on many other types of ships. And because of that, um, it's really good at siege power. And so what we're going to do is we're going to, once we learn that siege technology, we're going to build these with the siege technology on it. And that's going to allow it to drop other systems and turn them into ours. But for now, what we want to focus on is this ship. Now this ship has a discount on its cost, no matter what you um, put on it. it. It just is cheaper to produce them. They come out a little faster than most other ships. And what I want to do is make kind of a well-rounded um, ship. So the first thing to understand about the game's military strategy is there's kind of a rock, paper, scissor element to it. Um, different weapons are best suited for different ranges. You have the option of setting them any range you want. But missiles are the best at long range. Um, laser weapons are the best at medium range, and kinetic weapons are the best at melee range. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a couple of missiles on here. I'm going to switch this to medium range, and we're going to put a couple of lasers on here. And I'm going to switch this to melee range, and we're going to put a couple of kinetic weapons on here. And then, I think what I want to do, I think we'll go something like that. So why did I choose deflect? Well, deflect is only useful um, against kinetic projectiles. So it's, it doesn't have any effect against the other two weapon types, but it has a fairly significant defense against kinetics. Um, everybody starts with kinetics, so it's a safe bet at the beginning of the game to get kinetics early, kinetic defense early. The other option is instead of getting um, regular defense modules, I could just go for armor, and armor gives you um, a slight increase to your defense modules effectiveness but more importantly it gives you an extra 50% hit points on your ship so your ship has more hit points which can sometimes be better than defense modules particularly if you pick the wrong ones um, Maybe we'll do something more like that. Three of those, some extra hit points, everything looks good. Um, we got to give this ship a name. We'll just call it the same name as the class for now. And let's go ahead and get a bunch of these. Get a bunch of those going. Um, okay. Okay, so here's a good point in time to talk about. Um, notice our alien grafting 
has given us all the food we need. Our planet is completely popped out. We don't really need to be alien grafting anymore. We don't need to be making extra food. What we really need to do is this system is having a real hard time getting stuff out quickly. We need some more industry. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch this over to industry. And that's going to give us a fair amount of industry per turn. Got that picked. Um, I'm going to drop the approval to here for now. That's almost 50% more dust. 60% more dust per turn. Um, and we're just losing a very little bit on a system we don't need that much. So that's what we'll do. Alright, just a couple more turns and we'll call this video. blockade this system. He won't be able to get through with his colony ship unless he also brings his uh, his other ship. And I might be able to shoot down his colony ship as a result. This system is getting really close to no longer needing alien grafting as well. In fact, we're two turns away, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move this up now. Siege Kinetics in two turns, and then we can build those Siege Ships. He's gained another level. Um, food... Food is not that important at the moment, but you know what is important? Upkeep cost of ships. We're building a lot of ships, and in order to get the upkeep discount, we're going to go ahead and pick Wit. Now, what Wit does is it's going to increase our percentages on these two stats, but more importantly, it's going to unlock this on my next level up. So the next time I level up, I'm going to gain plus 20 dust on my star system, which is a nice little bump and can keep me in the positive while I'm building that fleet. It'll take a little time, but... Alright. He still hasn't colonized this yet look in this direction, but it ain't going to happen. Alright, we have our first military ship. Clan ship in five turns. Go ahead and build this. This will give us extra science on our star system, as well as more defense, in case uh, he does try to send an invasion force more for the science than the defense at this point in the game. Alright, let's take a look at what can we do. So we just set several um, of our systems to industry. It might be beneficial to maximize the effectiveness of that industry by adding this tech. So now instead of one extra industry per person or per population, we'll get two. And potentially more um, if the planet type were appropriate. Although it doesn't look like it is for our current three. We don't have a tundra planet yet. I have a feeling
feeling our ship's going to get destroyed. Um, the Siege Kinetics allows us to modify this guy. So we can modify him. I'm just going to strip him down of everything he had. Which wasn't much, as you can see. And we're just going to give him nothing but siege. Um, we can actually fit one gun on there. And that's about it. So there he is. That's our seed ship. We'll go ahead and throw... Everybody else is building stuff. We'll go ahead and throw that at the end of the queue. First ship battle. So here we go. Whenever two ships are in the same system, well, let's let's minimize this for a second. So you can see that I'm blockading the system. What that means is any ship that gets here has to stop for one turn. After that turn, they can leave, but they're stuck there for one turn. That allows either one of us to initiate combat. So he went ahead and he initiated combat by basically clicking on this combat icon. So we've been attacked. We're on the defense. So we would get the defender bonuses for our fleet. He gets the attacker bonuses. Um, if he had a hero with uh, any traits that would apply. So what we're going to do is we're going to choose from the cards that we have available what our tactics are at each range of combat. The primary thing that we need to do is just not die. So let's do this. So the way that these work is, this is rock, paper, scissors. So defense counters offense, offense counters tactics, engineering counters sabotage, sabotage counters defense, tactics counters engineering. And there's more cards you get as you play the game and unlock more technology in the trees. Um, they each have an effect, and then if you manage to counter your opponent, you get this extra effect. So you can get the bonus. Um, if yours gets countered, you get no bonus. You don't even get the effect. So picking can be kind of tricky. Um, it, generally speaking, it's best to pick the ones that are actually going to work the best for your ships. We know he's got kinetic weapons only. So do I. So that's why I'm choosing uh, deflector defense. Increases kinetics. Defense. Uh, we have auto or manual. I'm going to show you the manual and then we'll end this video. So this is a real pretty, pretty way to watch the fight. And all this information I'm not going to too much detail, but there's our ship, there's his ship. We're at the intro phase, we're about to enter long range combat. So this is where long range weapons are going to be the most effective. We both chose the same. So he should slightly out edge me due to his slight higher damage. Now remember, kinetics are melee class weapons, they're terrible at long range, so we didn't really do any damage to each other at that range. Now we're moving to medium range, and I actually countered his card, so I get my effect plus the bonus effect. Once again, medium range is a bad range for melee weapons. Then 
just not very accurate. And last but not least, I counted this card again. See if it matters. So it was pretty much a draw. Um, each army has a combat point or an attack point, and so we still have the ability to attack his ship if we wanted to. However, we, we didn't really win that fight. We're not going to win if we fight him again. So I'm not going to attack him. I'm just going to go ahead and end the turn. And with that, I'm also going to end the video. So I hope you learned something today. And. Uh, join me next time and uh, maybe we'll finish this game up or start a new one. Until then.